Chapter 3, Section 2.1, The Four Conventional Strategies. One of the most common complaints against supporters of freedom, and more specifically, the libertarian type activists, is the fact that they can't seem to accomplish any significant progress towards a free society. Actually, they don't seem to have any kind of clear step-by-step process to achieve a free society, and the ones who claim to have such a strategy can't seem to explain the mechanism that would allow their system to actually come into existence. So here, I will examine the four standard strategies commonly espoused for obtaining a free society. I view the first two strategies to be foolish and counterproductive at best. The third strategy I believe to be necessary, however only useful in hindsight each time the state fails to do what it claims exclusive right to do. Therefore, I don't view the third strategy as a strategy to assist the failure of the state, but more as a propaganda campaign for freedom. And the fourth strategy I view as the most critical of the four, and yet by itself it is incomplete. As I cover these four strategies, the reader may notice his or her feelings being pricked, as almost all of us have at some time used some of these failed strategies. I would urge the reader to press on, look for logic in the argument, and set aside feelings of loyalty and dedication to leaders and processes that have simply not produced what they have advertised. Don't allow yourself to be caught up in a kind of gambler's fallacy where you convince yourself to keep hitting the same spot over and over either because a win is due or because having invested so much in your spot you can't afford to change at this point in the game. Rather, see that the wisest move in a rigged game is to stop playing. Chapter 3, Section 2.1.01 Strategy 1, The Political Means Vote for Joe. Support this law. Repeal this law. Vote for me. I'm better than Joe, and I'll support this law while I repeal that law. Sign this petition so the government will do what we say. We'll win a majority, then we'll use democracy to force the world to be free. Without exception, every anarchist should already know that there are two fundamentally opposed means whereby a person can achieve their desires and their sustenance. These are work and robbery. There simply is no third choice. When you work to produce something or when you peacefully persuade someone to trade for something that has been produced through work, you're using the economic means to satisfy your desires and needs. The opposite of this is the political means or robbery where you use fraud, theft, violence, or threats of violence to satisfy your desires and needs. On the surface, There would seem to be a third means of satisfying your desires and needs, that being either charity or lottery. However, upon closer examination, charity lottery is simply a subset of either the economic means where the charity lottery is voluntary and is the direct result of the abundance produced by the economic means, or it's a subset of the political means where robbery is justified by giving a portion into the charity lottery, usually for a political advantage of some kind. This fundamental truth that all desires are fulfilled from either the economic means or the political means is the cornerstone of ethical anarchism. If you intend to establish a free society, no longer bound by the evils of government, theft, coercion, and violence, what kind of fool would you have to be to assume the path to obtain such a society could be found in utilizing government theft, coercion, and violence as your means? In addition to the blatant absurdity of using theft, coercion, and violence to stop theft, coercion, and violence, a thinking person should ask this simple question. Why continue to do something that, in the last 10,000 years, has never worked? That said, the direct political means, however immoral, provide something the other three methods lack. That is a theoretical mechanism to kill the state. Theoretically, some saintly, incredibly wealthy, and brilliant human could take over all the governments of the world, crush the international banking cartels, dissolve the government connection to corporations and the military-industrial complex, free the media to publish the truth, and break government bonds with the clergy and all education systems, and then choose to release humanity from the state by dissolving the whole system. And if you believe that is actually possible, you likely believe in unicorns, elves, the Easter bunny, and candy that falls from rainbows. Yet, 
That is a more likely scenario than the ones most believers in statism place their undying faith. An argument can be made that an activist involved in a political campaign, voting, petition circulation, lobbying, or some other political activity, can be doing that activity for the purpose of gaining the attention of the public or making a statement. The argument being that the political means can be an educational opportunity, not an attempt to change government. Oftentimes, the activist who runs for office will privately say that they have no intention of winning or that they are secretly an anarchist. (laughs) Oddly enough, they rarely say that publicly. In other words, their campaign is usually based on lies and deception. That's why I find this whole line of reason a weak argument at best. From a practical point, I view this like feeding a slot machine coins because it may be possible to strike it rich. Ignore the incredible cost and the almost guaranteed negative return on investment, and ignore the unstable grasp on reality one has to embrace to believe such fantasies, and ask yourself if you are being honest with yourself about your motives. If you are really campaigning for office to educate the public, are you sure you would follow through by refusing office if you were elected? And what about all that money that flows into political campaigns? Do activists who run for office to make a statement ever do so on their own dime or do they rake in donations from the gullible? When the politician makes their pleas for donations, do they make it clear that this is just a publicity stunt and they have no intention of winning? If not, isn't their campaign based on deception? Politics is aggression inflicted upon society, the strong upon the weak. It has been fairly compared to rape. Can you justify attempting to rape a victim for educational purposes if you promise to pull away at the moment of penetration? I can imagine no argument that would morally allow me to call myself an anarchist while using the political means to achieve my desires. I can imagine no argument that would morally justify deceiving people into giving me their hard-earned money for a political campaign that I knew I had no chance of winning. Secession is often trumpeted as a path to freedom, most prominently by the same people who supported and profited nicely from a longtime member of the U.S. Congress, Ron Paul, running as a major presidential candidate in 2008 and 2012, bagging some $75 million in contributions just to the official Ron Paul campaign coffers, not including income earned by a dozen websites that promoted his campaign, plus all the books, shirts, hats, stickers, and all other paraphernalia sold. All that aside, secession falls squarely under the heading of the political means, as it is always dependent upon individuals and government acting to permit said secession. Secession is accomplished using one of or a combination of two activities either by petitioning a government for permission to secede or through armed conflict to force secession within a geographic boundary. Armed conflict for the purpose of secession usually turns into revolution and no revolution has ever produced a free people. Revolution is a violent, bloody process that, if successful, exchanges the old tyrant for a new one, then forces that new government on people whether they want it or not. Petitioning the government, whether by voting or any other process, is the act of using government to achieve your desires, again, the political means. And once again, it has never produced a free people. Also, every secession movement to date has had, as an aspect of its purpose, a set of geographic borders to divide those people within the new governing body from those in the old governed territory to be enforced upon people on both sides of that border line by violence whether or not they wanted that border. That is the direct opposite of freedom. The truth of the matter is, if you scratch a secessionist, you get minarchist blood. Their true goal is a tiny local watchman government. Embrace secession and minarchism and ignore all historical examples of tiny watchman governments morphing into death camps owned by an empire or becoming the lapdog of that empire. Believing in secession as a path to freedom is literally a non sequitur. One simply does not lead to the other. There is no mechanism connecting the two. Secession is a simple exchange of a faraway master enforced locally to a local master. 
The proponents of secession often resort to slogans and mantras about anarchy being the ultimate secession of the individual. But again, their ranting lacks a mechanism to explain why a government of any size would ever allow secession down to the individual level. Secession is much like alchemy. It seems to make sense, requires lots of faith and an element of magic, and will never produce what it advertises. Yet its believers fanatically cling to it in spite of all evidence and logic. Why then do leaders of the movement still push the political means as a viable strategy to achieve a free society? I don't know the definitive answer, but considering that a conservative estimate of the overall profitability of the Ron Paul campaign tops $100 million and ended with his son embedded in the U.S. Senate, I suspect the answer is not that hard to imagine. But here is a different question. Is there nothing that could have been done with those millions of dollars that would have been a better investment to liberty than handing it to a politician and his little factory of cronyism and nepotism? Chapter 3, Section 2.1.02 Strategy 2, Civil Disobedience In my whole life, no other topic has caused more people to be angry at me than when I've explained the accepted legal definition of civil disobedience. The reason for such anger is that so many people have invested so much of themselves, including life, liberty, and property, in support of civil disobedience. Then when they hear the cold, hard facts, not washed through a poem by Henry David Thoreau, but the actual truth, they simply refuse to face the fact that they are not doing what they think they're doing when they commit civil disobedience. So rather than accept the truth, they take their frustrations out on me, the messenger. Fortunately for you, dear reader, I don't care how many angry libertarians and anarchists want to spew hate at me for popping their magic bubble. My only responsibility is to speak truth. Therefore, once again, I enter the breach. Civil disobedience is not an act of revolution, rebellion, nor anarchism. Civil disobedience is an intentional, usually peaceful, breaking of a law to demonstrate resistance, not to government itself, but resistance to that specific law while remaining obedient to the overall concept of government law. As such, most modern governments recognize civil disobedience as a rightful method to redress a specific grievance. Oftentimes in court cases, the civil disobedient does not face the same punishment as someone who normally would break the same law. So keep in mind, no matter the intent of the activist, civil disobedience is considered in the same category as voting, petitioning, sending letters to politicians, and marching in a protest. You may point out one or two specific cases where a person used civil disobedience and a court reacted with an extreme sentence or punishment. To this I would answer, of course this happens. You didn't think government thugs would obey their own laws and procedures, did you? They do what they want to do. Government justice is often dictated by the whim of a government judge who is lenient when he feels good and harsh when he feels bad. This is the one glaring reason that civil disobedience is almost always the most foolhardy choice a person can make when considering the question of how to influence government. And really, that is the key phrase. You're trying to influence government to behave in the way you want it to behave. In other words, you are back to using the political means to achieve your desires. An argument can be made that an activist involved in civil disobedience may be doing that activity for the purpose of gaining the attention of the public. The argument being that civil disobedience can be an educational opportunity, not an attempt to change government. This is a legitimate argument, but let's be honest with our terminology. If you argue that what you're doing, although it may appear to look like civil disobedience, is actually an attempt at getting attention, then let's call it what it is. It's not civil disobedience. It is a publicity stunt. Why deceive? Why not just be honest from the start? Why not admit you are poking the lion so that if the lion wakes up and tears you limb from limb, you'll have a great video for your social media page and you'll get more attention? This seems childish to me, but it can be considered educational. Of course, you may end up with your brain splattered across a sidewalk by an angry cop, but that will definitely go viral on the internet. 
In short, I would advise an anarchist to consider the possible cost of putting yourself at the mercy of a government goon and ask yourself if it is worth that price for the hope that a government may change slightly or perhaps your hit count on social media may increase. Again, I'm not condemning such stunts. I'm simply urging wisdom and maybe some good old-fashioned cost-benefit analysis to compare the risk to some other action that doesn't involve the possibility of death by cop. That said, no act or series of acts of civil disobedience have ever produced a free society. A slight temporary reprieve and tyranny can sometimes be achieved, usually at great cost. But like secession, there is no mechanism in civil disobedience that would cause the government to shut down and banish. For whatever civil disobedience is or isn't, we can be assured it is not a useful strategy for obtaining a free society. Chapter 3, Section 2.1.03 Strategy 3, Speaking Truth for Posterity The phrase, speak truth to power, is an old Quaker phrase that has been co-opted by several groups for different purposes. Although it didn't make it into print until the 20th century, Its origin is commonly believed to be a 19th century description of an event in 1655 when Quaker activist George Fox was captured and brought before Oliver Cromwell. Facing the threat of death by flames or worse, Fox proclaimed without fear or respect of person the truth as he knew it to be. Cromwell, a Puritan and a sworn enemy of the Quakers, was so impressed by this man of faith that he let Fox go free. Twice. Subsequently, the story has become perverted to purvey the idea that Fox spoke truth to power to influence government to do his bidding. Balderdash! Fox had exactly zero influence on the Cromwell government. George Fox almost certainly believed himself to be a dead man, talking as he rebuked, condemned, and reviled the murderer Cromwell. The fact that Cromwell's conscience struck him and caused him to act in mercy towards Fox speaks to Cromwell's Christian upbringing and parentage and not to the absurd idea that facing death, Fox tried to use the government that he so reviled. The witness of George Fox's life proclaims that any words he spoke to Cromwell were spoken with a full knowledge that he was speaking to the ages, not to some usurper on a man-made throne of blood and gore. Thus, we have the key. We must boldly speak truth in the face of power, not to influence power, but to state truth for posterity's sake. Ludwig Heinrich Edler von Mises said, Do not give in to evil, but proceed ever more boldly against it. Mises could have easily taken the path of Milton Friedman and sold himself into the service of the powers that be. But like Fox, Mises was not that kind of man. Mises boldly spoke truth in the face of power in Austria as a fascist Nazi shadow descended upon Europe, and then he came to America and continued to speak truth even as soft fascism continued to descend upon the earth by way of the fist of Washington, D.C. And so we should learn this lesson. Speak truth, not to influence the warmongering, hate-filled, violent mob called government, but speak to posterity. Speak as if your children and their children are watching and listening to every word you utter. Therefore, we speak truth for posterity, not to change government, and not to bring about a free society, and not to convince the naysayers. We speak truth to posterity for the sake of posterity. One fast note about filming police, and then I'll cover this topic more thoroughly later. Filming the police falls under this category of speaking truth if done properly. If you as an activist are filming police so that police will be more accountable or so agencies will hold police more accountable, you are not a friend of freedom. You are a statist. Stop reading this book, go lick the boot of your master, and leave the activism to those of us who know who our enemy is. If, on the other hand... You understand that police are nothing but violent enforcers for their state masters, and their only real job is to kill, maim, cage, and destroy for the purpose of intimidating the general public, then we are on common ground. Eventually, governments on all levels will outlaw the filming of police. Again, more on this later. But before that time comes, documenting the activities of police is a critical aspect of speaking truth for posterity. The only way we can justify the irregular warfare that is about to erupt is if we have thoroughly documented the brutality of police. 
The only way the rest of the world can know the oppression you face in your neighborhood and in your town is if we film not only police, but every oppressive action of the state everywhere it happens. Filming, recording, exposing, and documenting everything we can document is an act of speaking truth for posterity. This is true in the Americas, in Europe, in Asia, and everywhere governments use their enforcement boot to choke humanity, but it is also true in the neighborhoods and villages of Pakistan, Yemen, and other places where governments rain death upon the innocent for the sheer purpose of causing terror and hate, while filthy politicians in the West strut around claiming they are bombing for peace. In the future, our generation will be judged based on how we, as individuals, respond to the vile actions of governments around the world as they murder and maim the innocent in the name of peace. Chapter 3, Section 2.1.04 Strategy for Agorism Buckminster Fuller famously said, You never change things by fighting the existing reality. To change something, build a new model that makes the existing model obsolete. This foundational wisdom is why one person setting up a Bitcoin wallet and using it is a more effective means of fighting tyranny than all the end the Fed websites, books, t-shirts, rallies, and petitions combined. On the other hand, several breakthrough designs that Fuller invested in never caught on in the marketplace because they were crushed by giant government-backed corporations who were deeply invested in the old model. So as much as I love the genius of Bucky, and as much as I love the innovation of the blockchain, it is simply one wheel on the cart. By itself, it will go nowhere. For Buckminster Fuller's philosophy to actually work, someone must break the violent monopoly stranglehold the state maintains on the market. Despite all of Buckminster Fuller's genius, he never understood that corporations like General Motors, along with the U.S. federal government, would just slap down his new model and continue selling the old model. This is the current situation with blockchain technology and Bitcoin. As revolutionary and inventive as it is, and as valuable as it is in our struggle, by itself it will not produce a free society. It is simply one tool. I should clarify what I mean by agorism. Sam Konkin said, The goal of agorism is the agora. The society of the open marketplace as near to untainted by theft, assault, and fraud as can be humanly attained is as close to a free society as can be achieved. And a free society is the only one in which each and every one of us can satisfy his or her subjective values without crushing others' values by violence and coercion. I like that definition. I would add to that, agorism is counter-economics in action. Although black markets are part of the agora, agorism doesn't have to involve black markets. Growing your own veggies, repairing your neighbor's roof in exchange for a motorcycle, or riding that motorcycle without license or registration are all acts of agorism. Driving to Florida, buying a load of oranges from a farmer for cash, Taking those oranges to Cincinnati and selling them by a freeway off-ramp without a permit is agorism. Running a private loan business without permits or permission from government is agorism. I have long been a supporter and practitioner of agorism. It's not easy and you probably won't get rich, but there is a kind of satisfaction knowing you're outside of the state system. Full-on agorism has its dangerous side. Every bowman in the woods who refuses to support Prince John runs the risk of being kidnapped by the sheriff. And any time you find yourself in the hands of the state, your situation becomes precarious. State justice involves half-witted buffoons with badges enforcing the random edicts of crony politicians interpreted by judges who are typically failed attorneys lacking the energy, ability, or intelligence to live without the teat of government planted firmly in their mouth. So none of those people can be depended upon to act like predictable, civilized humans. Since the vast majority of agorism requires some kind of permanent base of operation, a farm, a compound, a storefront, or even a website, you become a stationary target for the sheriff of Nottingham to come snorting around looking for a cut of your business. For this reason, agorism requires wisdom and an ongoing balancing act to teeter between full-on fiscal independence and just doing enough to support the agora without landing in a cage. 
Agorism is not the end-all be-all that some would have you believe, but it is a necessary step in the right direction. By itself, it will never, as Konkin had hoped, starve nor bleed the beast in any significant way. If our numbers somehow grew to the point that the state were ever seriously endangered by agorists, government agents would simply label us terrorists, demonize us in the mainstream media, round us up, and cage or kill us. Instead, agorists can play the game wisely. You don't want your children indoctrinated by the state, so don't send them to government schools. You don't want to feed your family fluoride-infused food and drinks, so learn how to filter your water, avoid mass-produced food and drinks, and eat healthy. You don't want to serve the Federal Reserve or the international banking cartels, so use cryptocurrencies as much as possible and save yourself the cost of outrageous fees in the process. Approaching agorism with this mindset allows us to embrace the counter-economy without deifying a process. A sort of odd subset of agorism is a notion that peaceful parenting will descend upon a generation and bring salvation from our blessed mothers. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm not saying we should beat children. I'm only saying that, again, deifying a process won't bring a libertarian Garden of Eden. Please keep in mind, peaceful parenting is not new, is not a product of libertarian thought, and like other pie-in-the-sky fantasies, provides no actual mechanism of how it will end the state. Peaceful parenting libertarians will never reproduce at a rate so significant that their little angelic wonder children will have any kind of numerical advantage in a world of billions of statist children. Also, in spite of what a certain mind-controlling Canadian salesman purports, peaceful parenting doesn't guarantee peaceful children. I am the father of three peaceful adult anarchist children, and I can tell you there are many factors involved in raising children. My father was raised in the hill country of Appalachia during the 1920s and the 1930s and was never struck by an adult during his entire childhood. It didn't magically make him a libertarian anarchist any more than my mother was, and she was raised in a violent home where whipping children with a switch was a daily occurrence. By the way, she was one of 12 children, so I will not judge the morality of her parents for using corporal punishment, having never lived in a house with 12 rug monkeys swinging from the drapes. I will only say that as an aspect of agorism, child raising can only take us so far, and then we have to rely on something else to actually kill the state. Otherwise, we hand our peaceful children a world of violence for them to deal with. The oldest and most time-tested version of agorism is escapism. From monks in mountaintop hideaways to prophets leading followers into the desert, escapism is a go-to immediate but temporary solution to state oppression. Escapism is usually the choice writing mechanism used by libertarian and anarchist fantasy and science fiction authors because it's both an easy story to write and to sell. Typically, escapism involves some dynamic personality that the followers rally around, almost always a man with an angelic vision and a huge personality, and a fitting ego. In most cases, this version of agorism ends in one of two ways. Either the movement involved gradually becomes irrelevant, or someone in the established state structure notices them and government service descend upon the outpost where murder and or suicide end the rebels and cultists. Classic examples of the latter group include the mountain fortress of Masada, where some 960 Jewish Zakari unsuccessfully attempted to evade the Romans, or in modern times, the Jonestown Guyana massacre, the unfortunate folks at Ruby Ridge, Idaho, and the Seventh Day Adventists at Waco, Texas, who all followed the same escapism to their bloody demise. Needless to say, these methods have been proven to fail miserably at ending the state. The very best methods this movement ever produces is a small, isolated group that will eventually vanish through attrition, or the group becomes disenchanted with the dynamic leader and they abandon him to his creeping insanity. The other less common outcome can be seen in the 1800s Mormon anti-government, anti-establishment migration to Utah, where the radicalism was gradually replaced by mainstream political leaders. 
Now, after only 150 years, we see Utah as a seat of the NSA spy network, and the CIA has found Utah Mormons to be ripe for recruiting into its murderous enterprise. In today's world, we can watch New Hampshire's free state radicalism quickly being replaced by more level heads. So looking ahead into the future of the free state, we already see Orwell's animal farm working itself out as it did in Utah. Sorry, Snowball, but you and your little radio show are out. The one thing we never, ever see from escapism is even the slightest possibility of ending or even weakening the state. But that fact rarely affects the wide-eyed faithful as they follow their great man into the wilderness. Chapter 3, Section 2.2 The Need for a New Strategy To put it simply, the state is a problem. Fortunately, humans are innovative creatures. We are not just toolmakers, as the anthropologists like to call us. After all, lots of animals use tools, and some animals make their tools. Rather, we are problem solvers. For humans, tools are not just a way to crack a nut. Tools are a step in the process of problem solving. The human doesn't just find or make a tool for a job. The human keeps the tool and uses it or modifies it to fit whatever problem needs to be solved. Once the human masters a tool, the human will look for other tasks to use the same tool on. So the basket that was created to carry berries becomes a bucket to carry water and a bowl to mix the berries with the water. Another aspect of human nature is our fascination with watching other humans solve problems. For lack of a better word, we are voyeuristic, not only in our reproductive habits, but in our tendency to take pleasure in watching others confronting challenges and seeing others overcome those challenges. This is why we enjoy stories, novels and movies, and other forms of entertainment that tell the story of someone overcoming a problem. It's also the reason people like to watch game shows and reality shows on television. An aspect of this deeply human tendency is to copy or mimic the methods of problem solving that we observe other humans successfully utilizing. In spite of what authoritarians want to teach our children, copying is not cheating. Without the human urge to copy, we would still be naked, sitting under a bush in the Kalahari, eating bugs. But we are not naked eating bugs because humans naturally copy from each other. We make and modify tools and we solve problems. Actually, humans not only excel at problem solving, we thrive on it. The vast majority of games that people play are simply exercises in problem solving, and humans love games. So we should think of the state as nothing more than a problem. A very serious problem, but just a problem. And, I might add, the state is not necessarily the biggest problem humans have overcome. It's only the current problem. Remember, while other megafauna around us were experiencing mass extinction during and directly after the last ice age that happened in conjunction with radical climate upheavals, humans thrived and even experienced a sort of population explosion. Keeping the problem in perspective, we must reject the myth that the tools commonly used are the only tools that can be used. Since using the political means is both unethical and counterproductive, and since civil disobedience is nothing more than a publicity stunt at best and always involves unnecessary risk, and since speaking truth for posterity is great but does little, if anything, to advance our cause in the present tense, and agorism, although critically important, cannot achieve our goals on its own, we must have a fifth strategy if we are to succeed. So then, since our problem is the state, and to defeat it, we must break the power of governments, corporations, banking cartels, the media, the intelligentsia, and the clergy, why not copy from an entity who has taken this process to an art form? No one is as good at eliminating competition as the state itself. No one has more experience at killing governments, corrupting the media, discrediting the clergy, and baffling the intelligentsia than the state. No one is better at destroying a currency than the state. If we examine how the state kills competition, what tools the state uses to to destroy governments, and how the state manipulates the storyline to always favor a pro-state agenda, then we can copy the methods of our enemy and turn them on him. We have but two limitations. We must do this task while keeping our actions within the zero-aggression principle, 
and we must avoid the trap of central planning and leader dependency. That may be tricky, but it is not impossible for the species that figured out how to thrive during mass extinctions and ice ages. So what lessons can we learn from our enemy, the state, that we can use to kill governments, corrupt the media, discredit the clergy, and baffle the intelligentsia? During the 1940s, the major governments of the world were engrossed in a war that touched almost everyone alive at the time. The obvious aspects of the Second World War involved massive troop movements, the incineration of cities and people living in them, incredible destruction, the rounding up and murdering of populations, and stark hunger for millions who were robbed to pay for it all. Everyone knows at least something about that war. What is less known about that time is that even when warplanes stopped filling the skies and tanks stopped rumbling across the earth, there continued to be unseen armies engaging in sedition, subversion, sabotage, and irregular warfare. Not uniformed armies marching in lines, taking orders and throwing grenades, but workers, fouling machines, nurses passing secret messages, radio broadcasters spreading propaganda, and riflemen selectively disposing of high-value targets. So three governments were famously defeated in the wars of the 1940s. But in the decades that followed, dozens of governments were toppled, religions were perverted, cultures were crushed, and powerful corporations were brought to their knees. Was this done by activists chalking the sidewalk in front of police stations, video blogging about the Federal Reserve, or following some liberty cheerleader to his private Galt's Gulch in the desert? No. The CIA... The MI6, KGB, and Mossad did it with some of the tools in this book. If I do my job, I will show you the raw tools that should inspire you to develop the new strategy while respecting private property and the rights of the innocent and doing so without central planning and without a great man.